Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Lake of the Woods Church. My name is John Howe. I'm the senior pastor here. This is Adam Colson, our senior associate, and Jordan Medes, our associate. And we are just delighted to, to have you with us this morning. I want to read just a couple verses from Psalm 108. David said, My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. And then verse 5, he said, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. That's our prayer this morning, that God will be exalted in our midst here in Locust Grove and over all the earth. And uh, we know there are people viewing this broadcast over all the earth. So welcome to all of you. Uh, today, for those who are, are local, uh, we have our discovery class. We, we have a, a class, we used to have it twice a year and we hope to get back to that, but during this time of pandemic, we have not been able to have a, a class for newcomers. We call it discovery, discovering more about Lake of the Woods Church. And, and we hope many of those who take the class will wanna become members. Uh, so we're offering it for the first time in, in over a year and a half this afternoon at 3 o'clock. And if you're in the area, it's not too late to sign up. We do need you to sign up. Please send an email to suzanne.lentine, L-E-N-T-I-N-E, at lowchurch.org if you'd like to be part of that class. We're having it in person here in the worship center and you can also see it online if you'd prefer to do it that way. But, but either way, you need to sign up. Uh, it's not too late. We'd love to have you be part of that this afternoon. Adam, you said that you had a, a praise report. I'd love to hear it. Yeah, it, it's been neat to see what God has been doing uh, in the lives of our, our uh, chaplains, the opportunity he's been giving them to serve, the opportunities he's been giving them to um, to even expand out further into our community. Um, we are in the midst of our chaplain too course and and uh, already we've had quite a few requests come in to take chaplain one again and so we're just so thankful to the Lord for Do you that have numbers how many we have serving and how many have gone through it right now we have 12 chaplains mm -hmm. that are actively serving um, and our chaplains serve uh, not just over at our free clinic but we have a we have chaplains serving with fire and rescue we have a chaplain serving with a hospital we have chaplains serving uh, preparing to serve with prison ministry so it's exciting to see the wide range Tremendous and ministry. I'm working Working with uh, Pastor Medes uh, over the next uh, couple months, and we're actually taking Chaplain One class, and we're going to film it and take it online so that we can use it through Google Classrooms, so that we can continue to offer it. And so, if anyone's interested in taking Chaplain One, uh, they're, they're, I encourage them to reach out to me. Uh, we have an application we'll send them to fill out, and we'd love to get them involved in the Chaplain Absolutely. One training. Absolutely, it's wonderful, wonderful ministry. Thank you. Thank you. So, right around the corner. Ash Wednesday, and then Lent. Uh, it's impossible to process it, that. It seems it is. like we're still in Christmas almost. It, it but. does, but we, we are preparing for, for Lent season. Ten days away. And so that will begin with Ash Wednesday. We'll have an Ash Wednesday service in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. on February 17th. And then on Wednesdays after that, uh, our own Dr. Howe is uh, delivering a series on the Psalms, Hope in His Word, and that will be on Wednesdays here in the Worship Center at 645. Exactly. Thank you. Um, everybody's familiar with the Psalms. They've been called the church's uh, hymn book, uh, and we've all used them. But I, probably not a lot of people have really studied the Psalms, the different kinds of Psalms, the structure, the way God uh, has used them down through the ages. So this will be a very brief uh, kind of introduction to the Psalms. and. Uh, uh, as Jordan says, that'll be, we'll start with a little worship here and then the lectures will be at, at 7 o'clock. Subsequent Wednesdays, not, not next Wednesday, that's Ash Wednesday, but then subsequent Wednesdays in Lent. So again, thank you for coming. Welcome.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning to lay down our lives before you, most holy God. There is no holy one like you, Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like you, our God. Our hearts rejoice in you, Lord. Our strength is exalted in you, our God. You raise up the poor from the dust, lift the needy from the ash heap, and make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are yours, Lord, and on them you have set the world. You guard the feet of your faithful ones. Lord, set us free from the bondage of our sins and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. For your great love, grace, and mercy, we humbly say thank you, Lord God. Father, this morning we weep for this world. We weep over the chaos, the disarray, the selfishness, and the ungodly. Yet amidst the sadness of this world, we cling to you and ask for your strength and wisdom as we seek your kingdom. We pray for those in leadership, those in Washington in our local areas, our senators, our representatives. Give them a mind like Christ to lead as humble servants. And as we lead in our own sphere of influence, help us to be poor in spirit, mourn as you mourn, to be meek and to hunger and thirst for righteousness as we stand firm knowing that this world is not meant to last forever and your plan for those who are in Christ is one of everlasting love and peace in your presence. Father, help us to love, to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Our Father and our God, your word reminds us of your special concern for the poor, the homeless, and those facing adversity. We pray for those living under bridges or in makeshift tent villages, and for those who have too little to eat. Bless our ministry to the destitute through our partner, the Thurman Brisbane Center, and give them the gift of hope as they learn to put their trust in you. This morning we thank you, Father, for the part of the body of Christ here at the Lake of the Woods Church. We thank you for your faithful servant, Dr. Howe, his leadership, and his wisdom in opening the riches of your word to us. We thank you for those wishing to be a part of your church here at Lake of the Woods Church through membership. Help us to be the church to each other through service, through ministry, and through prayer. And so now, Lord, we mention the names of those in need of healing, provision, safekeeping, and strength at this time. And we close in prayer this morning with the prayer your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1 and beginning at verse 29. Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue in Capernaum, and they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening, at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, 
He got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues, and casting out demons. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let me quickly recap from last week. We reflected how very different Jesus' teaching was from that of the scribes and Pharisees. Whereas they frequently quoted numerous previous authorities on any given subject, Jesus simply declared, here's what I have to say about that. He said, verily, verily, in the older translations, truly, truly, in most of the newer ones, it's actually amen and amen. So be it. This is the truth. And it doesn't need a long list of footnotes. Mark said the people who heard him in the synagogue in Capernaum were astounded at his teaching because he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. But we noted it wasn't just what he said or even how he said it that grabbed their attention. It was Jesus' overwhelming authority in the realm of spiritual warfare. He stirred up a reaction in people who were struggling against forces they couldn't control, what the Bible calls unclean spirits. And when Jesus commanded them, be silent and come out of them, They did. We noticed that these unclean spirits consistently recognized who Jesus was and the authority he had long before most of the people did. And he consistently ordered them not to speak, and he drove them out with a simple command. Mark's comment from last week was that the folks in that synagogue were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Well, today's episode follows immediately on the heels of that one. Jesus left the synagogue, accompanied by the four disciples he had previously called to follow him. Two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew. At this point, Peter is still going by the name Simon. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They all went to Simon's house where his mother-in-law lay sick with a fever. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this story of Jesus healing her, but they tell it slightly differently. Mark says he took her by the hand, lifted her up, and the fever left her. Luke says he rebuked the fever, and it left her. Matthew says he touched her hand, and it left her. But all three add that immediately afterward, her response to being healed, whether she was touched, taken by the hand, or lifted up, was she began to serve them. We need to pay attention to that. When Jesus does something wonderful in our lives, it's not just for our own sake. It's so that we might be the conduits of his blessings to others. People who are touched by Jesus are blessed to be a blessing, forgiven so they can forgive, and healed so they can serve. St. Paul said that he had received such favor and blessing from God that he felt a sort of universal obligation to share it with others. That's J.B. Phillips' translation of Romans 1.14, a sort of universal obligation to share it with others. So, by the end of his first chapter, Mark has sketched out for us the threefold ministry Jesus said he came to exercise. He came to preach and prophesy. He was the prophet greater than Moses. He came to set people free from unclean spirits. In the words of Isaiah, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. And he came to heal the sick. 
And he said, let us go to the neighboring towns, for this is what I came to do. I've told you about my father's long battle with multiple sclerosis, which eventually took his life. But I don't think I've ever told you about an incident fairly early in that battle. Dad was virtually paralyzed, and they took him to Hartford Hospital. Karen and I lived fairly close by, and we had gotten to know Peter Marshall Jr., the son of a man called Peter, the chaplain to the United States Senate. Peter Jr. was also a Presbyterian minister, and he was very active in the healing ministry. He prayed for people, and a lot of them got well. I asked him if he'd go with me to visit my dad, and he said he would. When we got there, Peter was very direct. He said to my dad, I believe God wants to heal you, but it's not so you can go back to being the same man you've always been. If he heals you, it's so he can use you in a new way. Peter prayed briefly, and dad went into remission. It wasn't a complete healing, but he was significantly improved for the next several years. And he began a journey that led to his praying the sinner's prayer, asking Jesus to be his Lord. And he finally began studies toward becoming ordained. I had the privilege of tutoring my own father in that regard. But the illness returned and worsened. And as I said, it finally took his life. But in the meantime, he became a new person. Shortly before he uh, he died, Dad said to me, I pray every day that God will take away this damnable disease, but it doesn't look like he's going to do that. But I want you to know it's been worth it, because I've learned what I should have known all along, that I'm absolutely dependent upon him, and now I'm going to spend eternity with him. Did I wish that my father had been returned to the fullness of health? Well, of course. And eventually he was, uh, but not in the way we had hoped. So did the Lord answer our prayers when Peter and I visited dad in the hospital? I believe overwhelmingly he did. We had him for a few more years here on earth, but we'll have him forever in heaven. And that's the only cure that lasts indefinitely. I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way. We ask God to heal the sick, and sometimes he does. But it's always temporary. Even the people Jesus raised from the dead eventually died again. This life is not supposed to be the whole story. It's preparation for the life that lasts forever. And what a tragedy it is that some never discover that. The only thing that's permanent is life with God for those who put their trust in him. 26 healing miracles of Jesus are recorded in detail in the New Testament. In addition to about a dozen passages that say he healed many or all or the blind and the lame or those needing to be cured. And the first thing to be noticed is there is absolutely no set pattern as to how he did this. Sometimes he drops what he's doing and goes in person to heal the sick or even the dying or in several instances to raise the dead. Other times he simply speaks a word from where he is at the time. In St. John's Gospel, an official begs him, come down before my little boy dies. And Jesus says, go, your son will live. It takes the official a full day to get back home. And when he gets there, his servants tell him his son has been cured. When did it happen? He asks. Yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. John says the father realized that was the hour Jesus had said to him, your son will live. That's in chapter 4, verses 46 to 54. Sometimes Jesus lays hands on the sick person 
and others not. In at least one instance, he did that twice because the first time a blind man was only partially cured, Mark chapter 8. Sometimes he casts out a spirit of infirmity, as in the case of a boy who seemed to be an epileptic, but it was one of those unclean spirits, and Jesus cast it out. Other times he deals with medical problems that need to be cured. He was able to supernaturally discern which was which. Sometimes he pronounces forgiveness before dealing with a problem, as in the case of the paralytic whose friends let him down through a hole in the roof. Other times he doesn't mention it. Occasionally he implies there's a connection between some pattern of sin and a person's suffering. He says to the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda, do not sin anymore so that nothing worse may happen to you. Other times, he says exactly the opposite. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. Sometimes he says that a person's faith or that of his father or mother or his friends was instrumental in effecting a cure. And other times faith isn't mentioned at all. I become hugely suspect when people try to reduce healing to some kind of a formula. And I think some of the people God has gifted with genuine healing ministries sometimes make that mistake. They've seen people get healed when they've prayed for them, and they think they know how it works. Be careful. There is simply no pattern to Jesus' healings. But second, there is a completely consistent picture of Jesus' eagerness to see sick people made well again. In today's passage, not only did Jesus heal Simon's mother-in-law, it says the whole city was gathered around the door and he cured many who were sick with various diseases. Matthew says all. And we didn't read it, but the following paragraph tells of a leper who begged Jesus, if you choose, you can make me clean. Jesus replied forcefully, I do choose. Be made clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Out of those 26 recorded healings, in only 17 of them is Jesus asked to intervene. In nine of them, that's more than one-third, he acts without being asked. Evidently, he's more eager to give his help than we are to request it. And notice, when Jesus was asked, only once did he show the slightest hesitation about saying yes. In all the other cases, his response was just like, the one he gave to the leper. I do choose. Be healed. We looked at that one instance when he hesitated about four years ago. It's worth taking another look. You'll find it in chapter 15 of Matthew's gospel, beginning with verse 21. Jesus went to the district of Tyre and Sidon, and a Canaanite woman begged him, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David, my daughter is tormented by a demon. Jesus' initial response seems amazingly harsh and unlike him. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He seems to be refusing her because she's not a Jew. But the woman kneels down and says, Lord, help me. And Jesus makes it much worse. He says, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Wait a minute. Can this be the savior of the whole world? The one who is called a light to the Gentiles? Jesus is refusing her on the basis of her ethnicity? Is he a racist? Some kind of a Jewish nationalist? And he's calling her a dog? That's a horrible picture. Check out the commentaries. 
You'll find everything from this woman forced Jesus to change his mind. You find everything from that to she actually taught him more about grace than mercy than he had understood previously. Do you think that's what's happening? One I found particularly obnoxious said an inclusive egalitarian woman met an unsophisticated parochial prophet and converted him through her gracious humility. Do you think that's what's happening here? The story ends with the Canaanite woman saying, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus responds, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Matthew 15, verses 21 to 28. There are at least two possible explanations. The first is this was a test, plain and simple. Jesus did that on occasion. Before he multiplied the bread and fish to feed the multitude, he asked Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? And John's comment on it was this. He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. In Jeremiah 9, the Lord God says, I will now refine and test my people. He does that sometimes. If this was a test, the Canaanite woman passed it with flying colors. But the other possibility is that this was a teaching moment aimed not primarily at her, but at Jesus' own disciples. Matthew tells us they were urging him to send her away. And Jesus answered them, not her. Check it out. He answered them. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Could it be that he was saying, you are telling me to send her away because you think I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You think that healing her daughter would be like throwing the children's food to the dogs. How wrong you are about that. And the woman's response demonstrated that sometimes Gentiles have a more expectant faith than do the children of Israel. In any event, the daughter was healed, just as were the other 25 people whose stories are recorded in the Gospels. So let's go back to Simon's mother-in-law and notice one more thing. When Matthew tells this same story, he says that evening, Jesus cured all who were sick, all who were sick in Capernaum. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. In other words, Jesus' great work of redemption included reconciliation with God, spiritual liberation, and physical healing. We have no record of him ever turning anyone down. And scripture says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he doesn't play favorites. So how shall we think about these things in the middle of a worldwide pandemic? How shall we understand this here at Lake of the Woods Church, where at any given moment we have a lengthy prayer list, friends and neighbors struggling with various diseases? Is Jesus still in the healing business? Are these promises still true? I think there are at least five things that need to be said. Number one, no, we're not told of Jesus ever refusing anyone but we are told that when he went back to his own hometown, he could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief. Mark says he did lay hands on a few sick people and he healed them. But he wanted to do much more. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Blatant skepticism there was hugely hindering factor. It will be among us as well. Number two, I've heard people say, if God wants everyone to be well, why isn't everyone well? 
You know, there are actually a lot of things that God wants to do that don't happen. He wants everyone to be saved. Not all will be. He desires that we love our neighbors as ourselves. Most of the time, we're not doing that very well. He wants justice to roll down like waters and righteousness like an overflowing stream. Too often it doesn't. My point is we can hinder what God wants to do or we can work with him to make it happen. Number three, two of Jesus' sharpest parables both make the same point that we're to be persistent in prayer The story of the importunate friend who won't take no for an answer when he pounds on his neighbor's door in the middle of the night asking for bread for an unexpected visitor. And the story of the judge who finally acquiesces because a certain widow keeps demanding justice. That's Luke 11 and Luke 18. Both those stories tell us we give up much too easily, much too early. Luke says Jesus told these parables about the need to pray always and not lose heart. Evidently, losing heart and stopping praying was and is a problem. Jesus' own comment was, how much more will the Father give to those who ask him? Keep praying until you get an answer. Number four, as we've already noted... Every healing is temporary. There will come a time for every one of us when this life is over. The question is, will we have found eternal life before we leave this one? As much as I wanted my dad to be well in this life, I'm infinitely gladder that we'll be together forever. And number five, when God does graciously heal any one of us. It's because he wants us to serve others. Luke says, immediately, Simon's mother-in-law got up and began to serve them. Can we pray together? Father God, for all those hearing this message who are struggling with illness and debility in their own lives, or they have friends or members of their family similarly afflicted. We pray that you'll give encouragement as we, as we ponder these things this day. Help us to believe you for great and mighty things. And help us, Lord, when you touch our lives, to turn our blessing into a blessing for others. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You've never failed me yet So the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and keep you this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>